But the micro talks uh, are really, I think it's a really exciting thing that uh, earlier, later last year, uh, Mike and Tim emailed me and they said, we want to do something fun and exciting and super high energy because even though it's an incredible day, it is a long day in a room. So we upped the stakes a bit with some micro talks. And they're short talks, but not just short, they're very, very specifically timed. Uh, we have 10 speakers, each speaker got 20 slides, and each slide plays at precisely 16 seconds. There's no longer, it is no shorter, the talks have to fit like that, we could all fuck it up and it can go horribly wrong, and we will, you will just have an adventure with us stumbling over our own words. Um, so are you guys ready for some fast paced ranting, raving, crazy, not necessarily about making animation, but definitely about making animation in video games? I won't yell in the mic, I promise. Um, and our theme for uh, this year, I don't know if we'll do them in the future. Um, if you fill out evaluations and you like it, maybe we will, but our theme for this year was one of perception. So, with all that being said, uh, I'm going to read off my phone because it's the only way I practice this. And here we go. Hi, I'm Lana Bashinsky, and I am an animator with Blizzard Entertainment currently working on Heroes of the Storm. I'm here realistically because I'm new and therefore I don't know very much. This is my first big girl job, and thus the following are all mistakes I made or somehow stumbled my way into. This micro talk will largely be informative for those of you who are still students or are in your first year or two in the industry. To those of you who may have had to manage a wide-eyed newbie like myself, I would hope that this serves as a reminder, or if nothing else, has you wax a little nostalgic. My first year in the industry was a robust lesson in balance. It's exceedingly difficult to sum up the incredible levels of change my life went through in the first year on the job, but you can feel free to ask me about more specific anecdotes after the fact. My first and most important lesson was probably that no one really cares about you. When I began, I had the mindset that if I sat down, worked as hard as I could muster with a smile on my face, my employers would see my hard work and positivity, and my career would simply progress onward unimpeded into eternity. Needless to say, it was an incredible error. There's a palpable disconnect between what a manager sees as important and what a new employee thinks is important. It's so easy to feel neglected, but it's a business, not a summer camp. Turns out there's no gold stars for simply doing your job. They hire you expecting a high-quality delivery. The reality is that no one will manage your career better than you. You want to progress? Tell somebody. Set tangible milestones with your manager so you have a gauge you can both read to measure how you're improving over time. Be proactive with your career because no one will love it more than you. Learn your tools and then refocus on the craft. Stop trying to make the best work right out of the gate. Don't act like you know what's up because chances are you're working with some kind of proprietary something. Learn your pipeline and tools first. Ask a ton of questions so you've got at least one foot underneath you going forward. If you think you're communicating enough, you aren't. You should be talking to anyone you're directly or even indirectly working with a staggering amount more than you think you should be. There have been too many times I disregarded my own opinion just because I was new. I actually still find myself doing this. Realistically, if you see something, you should say something. Just because you're new doesn't mean your opinion isn't worthwhile. It is so much better to make a commotion over something that's potentially nothing than to not make a commotion over something that's potentially disastrous. As it turns out, almost nobody wants uninvited critique. Every point could probably start with this sentence, but this isn't university anymore. Many people aren't looking to get better in any sort of hardcore critical way. Establish a safe space for such things. Get to know your colleagues, but even so, I advise proceeding with caution. Progressing smoothly in the workplace is such an insane Goldilocks situation. Communicate, but not too much, or you obviously need supervision. Brainstorm, but not too much, because you obviously can't work independently. Learn to say no, but don't really say no, because you're not being a team player. Your colleagues, managers, and producers are generally going to be drastically different. Do what you can to find and install their various language packs so you can turn feedback into items you can understand and act upon. If you can find the root of someone's desires, you can deliver what they're looking for, even if it's not explicitly what they're asking for. Don't make work your only passion. Despite everything, you should be open to critique, because work is not about you. Overinvesting will leave you devastated when something is inevitably cut. You're being paid to do this. Make it great, but don't make it a personal outlet. Find a hobby. 
Yes, maybe you are lucky and have an incredibly robust and well-rounded workplace that fills each and every one of your creative nooks and crannies, leaving you to feel entirely fulfilled in your life by your job, but A, probably not, and B, job security is truly the gateway drug to stagnating creatively. RSIs are no joke. I distinctly remember laughing inwardly at a teacher who tried to tell her class how dangerous working at a computer could be. Joke's on me, I sleep with wrist braces now because otherwise I wake up with no feeling in my poor, pathetic, curled up little paws. Take care of your body. Work gets hard if life gets hard. Beyond finding creative extracurricular activities, you should have an extracurricular life. You know I'm still school-brained because I still think of anything outside my routine obligation as extracurricular, but what I mean is it's important to have a life away from the office. Establish a work-life balance early. Make sure you have personal outlets who aren't your colleagues, so if something in your life does become difficult, you have a safe space to leave that emotional baggage, namely at home. Please, everyone, I beg you to stop looking for your spouse in the workplace. You're there for a reason. You were hired because someone believes that you're capable. No one is doing you a favor for, through the act of employing you. Surprise, surprise, no one really cares about your self-esteem. You join a team because they see something that you can do that will make the project better. And so... Believe you can make it better. Don't sell yourself short. It is just as important as not being an egotistical asshole. Don't talk yourself or your work down. Do the best you're able to do and be proud of what you accomplish. Remember, not everyone gets to make games for a living. Finally, make sure that you stay connected. Be nice, make friends, and then make friends you can direct every single one of your embarrassing questions to. Like me. Hopefully before anything manages to happen. You can find me pretty much anywhere on the internet at Latai and I, or email me at lbashinsky at blizzard.com. Thank you for your time. So I've got to follow that. Uh, here we are. All right, so... Uh, you guys have seen me a bunch now today, right? Uh, I'm Mike Jungluth. I'm lead animator at Volition, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the boot camp here. So let's go. I stand upon this soapbox to give my perception of some animators' outdated perception of game animation, which is my long-winded way of saying some animators have got their heads up their asses. Now, what allows me to make such a sensational accusation? Well... Beyond the uh, animator cred that I hope this picture provides, uh, after interviewing some animators this year at Volition and reviewing some recurring feedback we get about the boot camp, I've had the chance to step back and look at the game animation landscape, and a few alarming tendencies keep popping up. First, some believe animation should be purely about asset creation, and that implementation isn't real animation work. Second, they want to focus on facial animation as a primary responsibility. And third, they're influenced primarily by movies, games, and comics. And this makes me sad because, you see, these are people that aren't cementing their futures, but cementing their feet to the bottom of an increasingly growing pool of animators. Even worse, it's limiting the performances of the characters they are creating, the design they could be communicating, and stagnating what the medium is even capable of. Now, I'm not here to undervalue the need to focus on traditional skills, but the slave-like devotion to the craft is becoming a crutch, not a valuable source of inspiration. The process and reasons behind the 12 principles is being ignored while bowing at the altar of the nine old men. Now, before you lynch me with your Pixar-pointed pitchforks, let me explain why this is so damaging. See, believing it's about asset creation is like trying to tell a joke by crafting only the words than having someone with a different sense of humor or timing tell the punchline. Implementation, not the individual assets, is where a fully realized character comes to life. A performance is about how all of a character's thoughts and actions come together, not the individual emotions or even individual words. When was the last time you watched Empire Strikes Back and said, damn, I just love the way Darth Vader said the word, father. But I can hear some of you thinking, well, if he didn't have a mask on and you could see the emotion on his face when he said the word father, you might have cared about the word or specific expression. This is why facial animation be, should be such a big focus, maybe. Except most cameras look like this, this, or this, right? Focusing on facial makes for some nice showcase moments, but it's a secondary form of communication in most games with little chance of subtle range, thanks not only to these cameras, but to the subjects we tackle. With most games <laughs> being focused on power fantasies, the primary expressions and emotions you're going to see are anger, disgust, and contempt. 
Certainly not something we need a team of animators focused on, which leads to the big problem at the root of these issues as I see it. When asked what inspires, the common answer is movies, games, comics. When what you spend most of your time doing, thinking, and talking about are finished forms of popular media, it'll primarily shape your work. Brad Bird said, animation is about creating the illusion of life. And you can't create it if you don't have one. I'd go a step further. You can't create interesting life if you have the same one as everyone else. Because if your life is consumed by all of the same experiences delivered by mainstream pop culture, how can you truly create performances that aren't just incestual regurgitations? The most influential and successful characters came from outside of the media loop. Pokemon from an interest in collecting bugs, Star Wars from the hero's journey, Nightmare on Elm Street from a newspaper article about Asian death syndrome. What's sad is we all know this, but we still live happily within the echo chamber. And what's just as sad as betrayed by my slides and references is I'm just as guilty of having these same tendencies. I'm always catching myself being a big old dummy about what makes me a real animator. But it's my hope and intention that we can actually change the perception of what it means to be a game animator. We're more than a singular fluid animation. We're more than a silly expression. And we're more than the toys on our shelves. We are the communicators of the game's characters and mechanics. And we give voice to the personality of the player. We're capable of communicating characters and experiences that haven't been seen a million times before. And it's our responsibility to do so with an authenticity and honesty that made all of the classic characters feel so real. Because that's how you create a lasting legacy, and that's how you inspire the next generation of creatives. And while I know for many of us, games, comics, and film were a form of escapism that defined our personality and allowed us to embrace the role of a social outsider, it should simply be our doorway to finding ourselves, not the place we hang our hat for the rest of our lives. So what's my approach? How about instead of another Stitch Pop vinyl, maybe a jade plant? Instead of this year's big comic event, look at the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. And instead of seeing that big blockbuster five times in theaters, find your closest state or national park and allow yourself to be immersed in the world around you because you never know what might become a new passion or inspiration for both yourself and the next generation of creatives. Here are a few of the different things that have delightfully surprised me in their inspiration. But I'd love to hear what motivates and inspires all of you. So look me up, drop me a line at any of these places, and let's go about sharing and inspiring one another with all sorts of new experiences and references. And I can't wait to see what characters, performances, and experiences you'll all create next. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Jeet Shroff. A vast majority of my time in the industry has been spent working on the design and development of character gameplay features on games like FIFA, Far Cry 3, and Just Cause 3. Currently, I'm the gameplay engineering lead at Sony Santa Monica. Now, crafting game characters that move and feel well-realized is a complex set of ingredients coming together. And hitting the right balance of emotion, intent, responsiveness, and fidelity is a tricky problem. But when your characters finally come to life with their gameplay, it feels amazing. So what's the magic formula, right? How do we go from good to great gameplay? An often overlooked ingredient here is the relationship that exists between the animator and the programmer or designer. And I'll use the last two interchangeably. So here are a few small things we can do to build stronger partnerships. First, remove the middleman. I'm hoping this is a thing of the past, but I still hear of teams that work in their own departments providing each other lists of requirements with work being passed down from team to team vetted by layers of management. And this drives me insane. Gameplay realization is all about rapid iteration. We know this. Nothing slows down iteration more than having to work separately on a feature in a silo, hoping that the work you do will magically work for the next person down the chain. If you take one thing from this talk, it's this. Next, try and sit together. There's the reason long-distance relationships are really hard and often fail. I wish I could go back in time and make up for all those wasted college years. But I promise you, 
when it comes to the type of work we do, proximity really matters. I've seen jumps in quality simply because programmers and animators working on a feature were rearranged to sit together. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you need to work closely, communicate often, and iterate, you're going to do a better job if that person is sitting close to you. Proximity inherently means trust. Next, establish a vocabulary. People are all different, particularly in the case of programmers and animators. I'm sure you know we can argue semantics to death. You will save a lot of time and energy if you simply agree on a vocabulary and then stick to it. This can and should apply to everything, from game features to technology and even animation sets and naming. It's important to know what everyone means when they say warping or interactables or reactions and what components of that, um, you know, of the game fall under those buckets, which leads us to finding ways to communicate. Communication isn't just about sending emails and doing stand-ups. Those things help but it's also all the additional things to get the information across. The first thing to start doing is communicating via actions. When you get up, act out, and show someone what you mean, things become so much more clear, even if that makes you look a little silly. And in cases where you can't act something out, communicate using reference. This really helps when you're trying to understand the subjectives, like when something isn't smooth enough or needs to feel snappy. I guarantee you, if you did a bit of homework, you'd find some form of reference, or better yet, another game that you can use to get your point across. Using reference really clarifies the deltas of what we want more of or less of, and those are hard things to communicate. There's so much more reference available now, so please use it. Next, care about each other's craft. We're not primarily here to talk about animated movies or TV, right? Sorry, JD. But we've chosen to be part of game development. Games are highly technical in nature. Not caring about implementation is like finally building that Ferrari for someone else to drive. Having a genuine interest about the how will make you a better game animator. And for the programmers, it's our job to educate our counterparts on how the tools and systems work and what that means for content. Take time to understand what good looks like for the animator. Do this for however long it takes and as often as necessary. Understand that this kind of development is a symbiotic relationship. Now, I know making games is like a never-ending race against the clock, much like this presentation. But we spend a lot of time doing things that are just bullshit. Meetings that we choose to go to so we feel important even though we don't need to be there, or hours of philosophical discussions about how to do something instead of just doing it. Do this instead. Spend time getting to know each other and each other's craft. Once you've got something working, play it together in the build. What's nice about this is you'll share your successes together when things work out. But when they don't, you'll get to see the problems and talk about them in the context of the game. You'll identify which areas truly matter and use it as a tool to generate meaningful work. Don't get caught up on titles. Look, titles matter. It's true. But don't let that get in the way of making the best game possible. Don't bias or pass over valuable feedback because the person talking to you isn't an animator or a programmer. Focus on a person's ability and then use your best judgment to, do what, uh, to decide what to do. Finally, a sure way of developing trust is simply doing your job, even though you might not get a gold star. But when you get things done, people begin to pay attention. And when you do your job well, people will begin to trust you. Thank you. This is when everything is going to go wrong, just to manage expectations. All right. Okay, does it automatically show up? Do I have to hit something else? Huh? F5, see? Guys, this is going to be great. All right. I don't know if this place... Hello, everybody. My name is Billy Harper. I'm the animation lead at Sucker Punch. And now for something completely different. Yeah. How many times have important discussions been held where really original and creative ideas were desperately needed, but where humor was taboo because the subject being discussed was so serious? It's not automatically advancing, so that's great. <laughs> Okay, no, why it's so serious? What John Cleese says here is, is unfortunately true. But I think that we, if we take ourselves 
less serious at the workplace, we can actually cultivate creativity. It's not advancing automatically. All right. I'm just going to... Okay. So this is my, this is my uh, cube at work. There's a quote down there that is the inspiration for this talk I- I itself. It's too long to read, and it's not going to... Uh, I can't say the, the entire thing. But basically, it means we have to have fun at work. The moment that you don't give a shit is when all of a sudden you have nothing to lose. And once you have nothing to lose, it's, it's going to be even more creative. I found this to be true. And that one's not playing. Awesome. The most creative had simply acquired a facility for getting themselves into a particular mood, a way of operating, which allowed their natural creativity to function, an ability to play. Play. We keep on talking about this. Create a safe place. It's okay to play. Get into the open mode where you are more receptive. It's okay to fail. This is a message that's repeated over and over. Even in this documentary, Six Days to Air, about the production of, a, of one South Park episode. The writer's room is, is off limits. I'll, I will only bother the writer's room if there's something that has got to be dealt with or answered right on the spot. We never had cameras in the writer's room. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, it's kind of a safe place. Again, safe place. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to fail. Like now. I don't take any offense. You didn't like my idea. And you got to feel like it is kind of, it's weirdly vulnerable. I've had friends that worked at other shows. And if you say something that doesn't work, they're like, yeah, it sucks. You suck. You're not funny. And these guys, it's, it's actually a very kind room. And I think like the worst you get is. <laughs> okay. She said, okay. All right. For me, a big part of this is. Uh, I don't no. take any offense. You didn't like my idea, and you got to. There we go. It's about perspective, and my perspective comes where I'm from. I'm from Southern West Virginia, Go Ears, uh, a coal town um, where it's physically tough. It's long hours. It's dangerous. There's actually a term called the hoot owl, which is a shift where you work all night underground. It, it's thankless. There's no legacy. You never had a child that come up to somebody with a lump of coal and say, thank you for changing my life. Um, it's also dangerous. Um, when, I was, when, I was in, was not, when I was in grade school, um, I had three different friends that lost their fathers in the coal mines. We don't make decisions that are life and death. However, we actually make decisions that allow other people to escape whatever may be depressing for them. That's... That's huge. That's, that's something that's aspirational. But how can we expect other people to escape if we don't have the facility to be able to escape ourselves, to be able to come out of the, 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 the day-to-day and just have fun? Here's some of the methods. One of my favorite, this is why I'm starting with it, get together, go to a bar, get drunk. There's no hierarchy there. And you talk about stuff, and then awesome games happen, guys. <laughs> There's no way alcohol didn't have anything to do with this game. <laughs> um, another thing at Sucker Punch, uh, we, have, uh, we have hip chat. We have chat rooms that are dedicated just for people to go and have fun. We have one called the Mark Wahlberg experiment, Experience, where we post pics of Marky Mark, and then we actually have a theory about whether him and Matt Damon are the same person. Um, <laughs> We also have the ideal wall. This is an open wall in the hallway that you can just walk by and you can take a card and a little magnet and put it up and you have an idea. And other people can go by and they can put a little thumbs up beside it and they can like it. And it's okay. It's, it's, it's okay if the idea isn't accepted and it's a lot more op open. Um, now here, though, is why I'm wearing my, my suit that everybody sees. My, my favorite method to do this at work and to get into a state of play is on the mocap volume. Is it playing? It's not playing. It's an area we have at, at Sucker Punch that we don't have to worry about how much time we're spending there because it's, it's, it's free. Um, and we get to play with others. As Principal McGee says, it's better to play with a group than with yourself. 
So let's go back to the, uh, the original quote that was too small for you guys to see uh, from Bruce Lee. Art reaches its greatest peak when devoid of self-consciousness. Freedom discovers man the moment he loses concern over what impression he's making or about to make. That is truly the art of not giving a shit. <laughs> um, let's see. So, so basically what you want to do is you want to help others create a safe, safe spot at work. Play with others at work. Don't play with yourself at work. <laughs> HR smile, they, they, they frown on that, guys. It's happened twice now. Um, so have fun. Get, get drunk with people. Meet up with your friends and just get inspired and come away and help other people get inspired. I want to leave that up there. That's oh, now he said. Oh, yeah. I feel like this didn't need to be as complicated as we made it. Can everybody, no one can see it. What is Drag it over. I I couldn't figure out PowerPoint. Oh shit! <laughs> now we're skipping ahead. Oh my god, this is really hard. It's probably not hard. I'm just not bright. Okay. Is it gonna? Hi, my name is Gwen. My name is Gwen Frey, and I'm a technical animator. I've been in the industry for eight years now. Uh, about two years ago, I went indie, and I just shipped my very first indie title, The Flame and the Flood. But, woo! But my talk is not about that. My talk is not about animation. It's about animators. I want to ask a very important question. Why are animators so damn weird? <laughs> because being an animator is not a job like working in a bank or something like that. Being an animator comes with an identity. It's like how when you see a used car salesman and someone tells you that they're a used car salesman, you go, oh, I'm never going to trust you. When someone says they're an animator, you know they're going to be weird. And I was trying to figure out why. Like, maybe only weird people want to become animators. Like, maybe this is a field that attracts weird people, but that's not the case. People start normal, and then they start animating, and then they lose their minds. And I have some theories as to why. My first theory is this. I believe that watching the same thing on loop all day is literally torture. And I'm going to give you an example now of what it is like hey, to scrub What could be better than this? What could be better than this? Hey, what could be better than this? What could be better than what could be better than what could be better than mother of me? What could be better than mother of me? This, this, hey. That was 16 seconds. What could be better than this? That was 30 seconds total. <laughs> if you work an eight hour day, you would see the equivalent of that clip 28,800 times. You'll dream about that at night. <laughs> That'll stay with you. But it's not just actually watching the animations. When you animate, you make the face of the characters you're animating. Like, you get into character. You have to. You can't help it. So you'll be sitting at your desk making random ass faces as you work. And this can be good. Like, if you're working on something that's cute and adorable, or if you're working on a character that's happy, you'll be smiling all day. You'll be smiling all day, and you'll be like almost a little bit stupid because you're just cheerful for no reason, and you're skipping. Because that's what happens when you smile all day, but most games aren't like that. Most games are dark. 
<laughs> so you'll find yourself making angry faces or sad faces or whatever your character is going through. And then you'll go home and you'll pick a fight with your boyfriend for like no reason. And that's not okay. But it's even worse than that because before you animate, you've heard everyone talking about it, you actually act out these scenes. So you get to act out dying slowly. <laughs> you get to act out crawling to your inevitable demise. You get to act out whatever the fuck this is. <laughs> and like, and you're probably not very fit because you sit at a desk all day. So you're not going to look cool while you do it. You're going to look ridiculous. This is especially true when you work on an animal. Because I guarantee you, when you're working on that dog, you're going to be like looking around like a dog would. Or you might get down on all fours and act out the scene as if you were the dog in order to pace it. And your coworkers will judge you for this. <laughs> This is not normal behavior. Imagine that you're at a bar hanging out with your, like having beers after to bond with your coworkers and they've seen you acting like a dog and you're unhinged because you've been watching the same thing on loop all day. What are you going to say to them? You, you're a subject matter expert in the most random shit imaginable. Like, I can't tell you what's going on in the world, but I know this shit about bats. <laughs> I made that slide from memory. This one too. And that's even worse because once you study the human body, you lose the ability to do things unconsciously. I can't blink anymore. I just <laughs> close and open my eyes at intervals so that they don't dry out. So if you want to know why animators are weird, this is why. We've been watching the same thing on loop all day, listening to the same audio over and over and over again. We have random injuries because we probably sprained something. I sprained my ankle standing up from a desk too fast one time. Uh, we only, we're subject matter experts in the most random things, depending on whatever it is you're working on. And we're hyper aware of our own motions. Like, I don't know where to put my hands right now. That's my talk. I do. On. I have 10 more seconds. I am giving a talk Wednesday, like a real talk, Wednesday at 11. Come check it out. I feel like I'm going to be real fucking downer after that, so I apologize in advance. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's try this again. Thank you. All right. All right. Computers. I'm here to talk about using computers. Just kidding. Hi, my name's Ryan, I make animation for video games. I believe in tough love and I'm gonna say things fast and harsh but know that I mean it all playfully. Despite the title, this is not a talk about bullshitting a company into hiring you even though you suck. But I know about that too. This is a talk about bullshitting your audience into believing you know what the hell you were doing, like I'm doing right now. Most recently I've been animating guns on the Battlefield games. Some people think, think this means I'm a Republican, but I just like mechanical stuff. It's satisfying for me to animate something that has a right way, and it appeals to my inner contrarian to do something that at a glance looks wrong, but the experts recognize is correct. So last year, when this microtalk idea started to collate, I wanted to rant about everything that devs get wrong about guns. Guns have been around for centuries and don't work in mysterious ways, but we still see them used wrong all the time. Then I realized, with the help of my boot camp colleagues, for many reasons, what a totally fucking stupid idea that is. Because judgments about politics and the violent tone of AAA video games aside, the problem I wanted to rant about is a lot simpler than that. When we animate a real world thing but it works like bullshit, it's for one of two reasons. One, designers, for reasons that can be for good or evil, have evoked the sacred words for gameplay. Or two, the animator responsible is willfully ignorant to the relevant facts. One of these things is a, much, is a reality of game development, and the other is a much bigger problem in animation than people holding guns in a stupid way. Who are you going to shoot there, Will? So instead of guns, I'm going to talk about reference. This is not a rant about bad cliches like one-handed shotgun pumps, three-point landings, or excessive downshifting, but those really chaff my ass too. Those are stylistic choices by the kind, made by the kind of people who still think the Wilhelm scream is a funny Easter egg. No, I'm here to rant about truth, facts, and reference, from how mechanical objects work to broader areas like basic physics. We all know we can go out and learn something when faced with a new animation challenge, but too often we don't. We know we're supposed to collect reference, but when was the last time you did, beyond maybe getting up and videotaping yourself something you're not actually very good at? 
I say ignorance because it's fine to bend reality when we can explain our decision, but you've got to know the rules to break the rules. And because it's cool, it isn't always enough. And let's be honest, game developers might not always be the best arbiters of what is cool to the mainstream. I mean, probably half of us are wearing a t-shirt that we got for free. We all want our performance to be cool. We want people to see how great it is because we wouldn't have gotten into the arts if we didn't need the constant validation of our peers. But it's not just smooth curves and strong poses, it's the illusion of life. And too often we forget that some viewers are more familiar with our subject matter than we are. This is why we collect reference. Did you know that in 1936, Disney had a zoo on the lot? Of course you do. You read Disney's animation Bible just like the rest of us. You can name all nine old men and all 12 principles, but when was the last time you really dug into your subject matter before you started setting keys? Talking fast. Because of that zoo, 80 years later, Bambi is still a pretty damn good representation of a deer. The anatomy, the personality, the movement. The rest of the animation industry was barely past rubber hose arms when they made this beautiful bastard. Not because of talent, but because of reference. You have to know what you don't know. Because when animating some sports shit, a fight, or whatever, count on the fact that someone in the audience, and maybe a lot of someone's, know the subject matter better than you. So when your Taekwondo dude does a cool move exclusive to karate that you found on YouTube, and your fiction hasn't explained why, you've just potentially pulled someone out of a magical moment. For some small but not insignificant, insignificant portion of your audience, your lack of diligent research has broken the illusion you were hired to create. No, you're not ruining the game, but that moment of disappointment that someone just felt, you did that. Shame on you. <laughs> Let's do a quick case study. Archery is not an obscure sport. Nearly 20 million Americans participated in archery events in 2012. Nearly 10% of this country can shoot a bow to some degree. But when Katniss, Merida, and Hawkeye hit the big screens, we saw the proficiency spectrum range from mastery to complete bullshit. <laughs> the director of Brave has been an archer since age 12. Jennifer Lawrence trained with an Olympic archer for the Hunger Games. Jeremy Renner trained with somebody else. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the Avengers had the biggest budget of any of them. So how does this happen? Simple. It happens by not doing your fucking homework. Animating something wrong won't ruin the game, but it's not harmless either. You break the illusion not only for the nitpickers, but for the passionate people like you who can't not notice the way you can't not notice when a limb pops or a foot slides. When you don't do your homework, you tell the audience, I underestimate you. Never forget that the level to which you and your team care is not the limit to how much your audience is allowed to. It's easy when you're sitting at your desk to forget just how far your reach is. Empathize with your audience. Care about how much they care. Sometimes animators think reference just means recording themselves, but if you don't know what you're doing, is that quality reference? <laughs> Acting isn't the skill of turning on a camera from the front. Find or shoot reference that is actually useful. If you don't know, learn. A picture is worth a thousand words, so what's a feeling worth? Obviously, you don't need to fight in the UFC before animating combat, but you might be amazed at how much you can learn about punching in a couple of hours of boxing class. And you don't need to be Eddie Van Halen before animating for Rock Band, but I promise, the musicians in the audience are looking at your chord shapes. And of course, I know what some of you are thinking. Yes, of course, there will always be cases where you have a perfectly valid creative reason to deviate from the source, and sometimes the real thing does look stupid as hell. I am not saying you should be a stickler for realism in everything you animate. I'm only saying your animation will always be better for having gathered good reference than if you hadn't. Thank you. Be awesome. Okay. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I am Danielle Riendo. I am the reviews editor at Zam. I used to be at Polygon. That might be where you might know me from. And I am here to talk about... Not being an animator at all, whatsoever. I'm a boxer, I'm an EMT, I'm a game critic, and this is about as advanced as my animation gets, this nice uh, two-frame walk cycle here. I do, uh, I do a little bit of hobbyist stuff sort of for fun on this level, uh, but I can tell you, and what I'm here to talk about today, is uh, sort of what animations mean something to players, to somebody who does not know what they're talking about when it comes to animation. Uh, that's me, here we are. 
uh, I can tell you what really struck me, and I want to sort of uh, let you know that these things are incredibly important to players, so I know you probably fight for them. Keep fighting for them. So the first one is Dropsy's Hugs. Dropsy is a game from last year. It's my favorite game from last year, and it's about an evil-looking clown who uh, likes to give people hugs and solve their problems which is pretty cool and really nice and really special. Uh, and the game is a point-and-click adventure game, a traditional adventure game, but it really sort of shows the sweetness and the wonderfully you know, nice and, and happy, warm feelings. Uh, and it goes a long way. This animation goes a long way in sort of showing the worldview of the developer and of that particular game. And it's a good example of pixel art, which in my opinion allows you to make these really big statements with just these tiny little elements, a few lines, a bunch of color, and it just shows so much more. It, it evokes more than it actually shows something more realistic. Next one is Lara Croft's ponytail squeeze. Every time she gets out of the water in Rise of the Tomb Raider, she actually wrings out her hair, which is a thing that almost every woman I know who has long hair does if she works out or swims or any of these cool things. And this was something, whoa, we have volume. This was something that I noticed every time she got out of the water. And you know, Lara Croft is this super heroic woman. She fights bears, she fights fighting men, she takes on special forces, but she still takes a minute to, you know, get that water out of her hair every time, uh, you know, she's gotta be at her best. She's gotta be focused, she's gotta be in it. Uh, more than anything, any dialogue or any gesture in the game, this really endeared me to Lara. This made me feel like, hey, she's human too, even though she fights bears uh, and is good at archery and other cool things that I will never be good at. Uh, the next one here is uh, Henry's little stair tap. Every time he, in Firewatch, every time he walks out of his uh, tower, he sort of touches the top of the stairs. Uh, he's the protagonist in Firewatch. He's a middle-aged dude who's sort of escaping his normal world, and this is sort of a foreign world for him. This is a rustic, uh, different kind of place for him to be in. Uh, that moment just says so much about him. He's a tall guy. He's a dude who likes to make you know little connections, and he's literally feeling out his space in this. Uh, it's the sort of thing I've known taller folks to do. I am tiny and short, so I don't do it, but it's something I've known a lot of people to do. And it kind of uh, adds a little bit of his character right there. Even though it's such a tiny little touch, it made me feel a little closer to Henry. I think this uh, presentation might have stuck. Uh, in which case... Yep, it went to sleep. <laughs> I'm going to hit space bar again. And again. Oh, oh, do we? Oh, my goodness. Now I want to go back. It's okay, everybody. Everything's great. No need to panic. Maybe start panicking. <laughs> I'll just go from here. We might have missed a, a moment. Here we go. Okay. So I was just going to talk very briefly about the fact that you see Henry's hands all the time. Outside of that, you know, sort of tapping animation, uh, you also see his hands literally uh, everything you do. You know, it's a first-person game, so... It's basically seeing hands in every action. And you see his wedding ring on his left hand every time you see his, uh, his hands. I'm just going to go forward because I think this slide made this computer very angry. Okay, uh, the next animation is the only non-human, non-character animation in this entire uh, presentation. And it's from The Witness, a game that made me very angry. Uh, a puzzle game that's about an island that doesn't move or really change with your interactions very much. But when you do finish an area in this game, you get this slow, deliberate little, little animation. This, this wonderful, you know, almost like a victory lap. Like, enjoy it. Something happened. You know, something happened on this island. And it's slow, it's subtle, it's really, really, God, you know, just like, oh man, this laser meant everything to me. I did a dance every time I finished an area. I literally did like a whole, I can't dance so I won't try it, but I did a whole thing. Uh, and it, you know, reinforces these heady philosophical ideas in The Witness about, you know, being rational and so on and so forth, but it, made, it just made me dance. Last one is Chloe's face after that kiss in Life is Strange. 
So this kiss and Chloe's reaction to it uh, is just one of the moments that best exemplifies Life is Strange as a whole. You know, it's a game about being an awkward teenager, you know, still figuring things out, still working out their identity, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and Chloe, in this case, the girl with the blue hair, is this prototypical bad girl. She dares Max to kiss her. And if Max makes that bold move, it just surprises the hell out of Chloe. Uh, showing again, this is an awkward teen. Uh, she's just sort of figuring things out. She's not really such a bad girl. She's just like, whoa, oh my god. And it's just this incredible, incredible moment in a game that is really about sort of very raw feelings. You know, some of the dialogue in Life is Strange turned people off, uh, but I think the pure emotional content framing and just overall, yeah, of that moment uh, is something really special. So that's pretty much my talk, and I wanted to tell you all that we notice these things as players. You know, somebody who doesn't know a damn thing about keyframing and making things work um, I notice these things. So keep fighting the good fight. Keep making sure those really special moments get in the games. And thank you very much. I have a video like Gwen. Uh, no? What do I make it? Control F. Hold on. How do you make it full screen? Control F. All right. One second. Hello again. Hopefully this works. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Simon. Uh, so right now you're wondering two things. Uh, first, what's this confusing feeling I'm having right now? Um, and second, holy shit, E3 is right around the corner. Uh, what are these nine things I need to stop doing right now to get BeachBot ready? Um, well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, these are things we've all done in our career at one point or another. Uh, and I'm sharing them today so hopefully we can learn from them and never do them again. Um, so, number one, as we wait for it, stop using handheld cameras when the shot doesn't call for it. POV cameras are almost always the wrong decision. Uh, when you use a camera in this way, you're implying that the viewer is an active participant in the scene. Uh, if they aren't, the result just feels creepy uh, and completely undermines the purpose of the shot. Ask yourself what the intent of the scene is and choose the camera and composition to support it. Sometimes this calls for POV, but more often than not, it doesn't. Stop being a creeper and come on, <laughs> come on, everybody. We're better than that. Number two, stop thinking that just because you're using mocap means that you get to throw out all the shit you learned in school. And if they taught you to use raw mocap, go back and get a refund. Because humans don't always move in the most appealing way. Timing, staging, silhouettes, arcs, these all need your attention regardless of the source. At the end of the day, you as the animator are responsible for what ends up on screen. As much as Golem might disagree, even the best performances by the best actors need some digital makeup. Because at the end of the day, we're better than that. Oh, no, I lost my note. Uh, number four, stop using out of context. Oh, whoops, I skipped one. Uh, stop animating anything before planning it first. There's no way in hell you know from memory how everything moves. Not even, uh, the time you spend planning a shot will almost always be less than the time you spend doing revisions if you hadn't. Shoot, shoot reference. Nervous acting in front of your coworkers? Get over it. They hired an animator. They expect you to be eccentric. Don't let them down. <laughs> Because, everybody, we're better than that. <laughs> Number four, stop using out-of-context idols. Did your hero forget to go to the potty before he left the house? If not, why is he doing the pee-pee dance? And also, why the fuck are game characters so out of breath all the time? <laughs> Try to do something more subtle, more contextual. Maybe react to their surroundings. Maybe they're scared or injured. Try using a hierarchy of needs if you need to find out what their immediate want is. Conveying these things in your characters will make them much more believable and engaging. 
But no more pee-pee dances, especially if you don't shoot reference first. We're better than that. Number five, stop acting like your job ends when you hit export. If you want to just be handed shots all day and sit at your desk with your headphones on, I suggest slumming it in TV or film. Your responsibility for a character's movement doesn't end until the game is in a player's hands. This means getting your hands dirty in the engine, working with designers during every stage of development and championing that quality of movement. Keep pushing that quality until they have to pry your hands from the perforce submit button. Because... because <laughs> almost made it. Uh, number six, stop waiting to finish an animation before testing it in-game. I've got a spoiler alert. Your animation is going to suck the first time you put it in the game. Want someone to tell you that after one hour or ten? The shorter the intervals between iterations, the higher the quality of your work. Establish timing, staging, silhouettes first. Non-animators might have trouble seeing blocking at first, but be patient, help them to understand what they're looking at and how to provide the right kind of feedback. And don't whine when folks give you major changes. Because... <laughs> Number seven, stop only worrying about fodder for your demo reel. You were hired to collaborate on a product, not work on your portfolio. When you're asked to make an animation you think is beneath you, check your ego at the door. Make that stand-to-run transition the best fucking stand-to-run t- transition the world has ever seen. Making video games is a team sport, not a guitar solo. If you're focused only on your reel, you're going to find yourself needing to use that reel sooner than you think. Don't be like that, because we'll get there. (laughs) Number eight, stop resisting feedback. The best animators on the planet know that there's room for improvement. What makes you so fucking special? You may say you like feedback. I know you. You don't. If someone takes the time to offer an opinion on your work, embrace it. Everyone wants the same thing, to make the best damn game possible. Your job isn't to tell them they're wrong, it's to find out why they feel that way. It might not be what you want to hear, in fact, I hope it isn't. You don't get to be better by having your belly rubbed all day. Number nine, stop undervaluing yourself. On so many dev teams, animators still aren't given much of a voice. But when you act like you don't have a voice, you're, not going, to be look- you're going to be looked at as a service provider. You bring value to the team. Your perspective as a storyteller, actor, designer are all assets for the game team. And for fuck's sake, stop working for free because we're not cheap hookers. We're high price escorts, damn it. (laughs) And remember. (laughs) Thanks. I am going to be um, representing Steve Jobs here at this talk with my fancy MacBook. Don't be jealous. Let's see. Come on, Steve Jobs, bring me down. All right. Whose water do you think this is? It's gross if I drink it. And I'm going to try this one. Oh, yeah. That one had a slime to it. All right. My name is Mark Pulleyblank, and I'm an animator and a visual effects artist, and I'm embarrassed to say that I've mostly worked in film. Sorry. At such slum holes like Weta Digital and... Sony Animation. I'm also the CEO of The Interactive, the animation director at cgspectrum.com, a lecturer at California State University, a musician, a composer, a father of four, a mediocre husband, but a really kick-ass braggart. (laughs) All right. With that said, one of the more frequent questions I get asked is, how do you stay motivated? It's a great question, and the answer is, I don't. Not always. But I do have strategies. Because it sucks to suck... We all like to do things we're good at. For example, because I haven't made many slides, I'm not good at making slides. I don't like making slides. But I do like this, talking in front of people and feeling important. So I know I need to sort it out, and the most important and most difficult part of the process is to just simply get started. Bam! Here we go, a pretty blue gradient. Blue is good, worked for Facebook. A playful new font that's not Comic Sans. I think it's Brady Bunch. 
It doesn't have to be amazing. It's not going to be amazing. But at this stage of the game, I'm just trying to focus on the process, not the result. We live in a results-based world, and this idea that one, what we're about to create has to be amazing before we even get started is one of the biggest obstacles to our creativity. The way we get better is doing, and it's extremely difficult to keep doing when our fulfillment is married to our results. Recently, I asked a class of university students that if they could take a magical pill that would instantly make them great at what they do, would they take it? And of course, they all said, yeah, every one of them. And I get it. Being a student is scary, loads of pressure, but this thinking is backwards. Process, on the other hand, is the doing, the act of creating. As kids, we have this figured out. My six-year-old daughter cuts paper. She leaves it scattered all over my house. She has endless motivation for the process and doesn't care one bit about the result until I ask her to clean it up, and then suddenly I'm an asshole. (laughs) Someone once said that the secret to success is doing the stuff that nobody wants to do, and in animation, luckily, that's pretty much all of it, right? So you're not always going to love it, and that's okay. Just relax and remember that when somebody challenges your ideas, it's an invitation to grow, not to fight, which brings me to this handy but difficult tip Own up to your fear. This stuff is personal, and having our ideas rejected over and over again is not only frustrating, but it breeds insecurity, which is creative kryptonite. So in navigating these waters, I like to ask myself this simple question, do I have the best interest of the project at heart? This is completely liberating and frees me up emotionally to collaborate. The more that people trust your motives, the more likely they'll be to seek out your opinion. I'm going to talk about Brad Bird again. He once said, make it okay for people to challenge your ideas. The good ones can withstand it, and the bad ones fall away to reveal something better. And to me, that's one of the purest explanations of creative collaboration I've ever heard. Now, I'm going to sound like an old man, but my next tip is about distractions, because this shit makes me crazy. We live in a time of unprecedented distraction. We are literally two clicks away from millions of bits of entertainment. And if you really believe that you do your best work while streaming internet content, then imagine you're an astronaut strapped to a rocket on a launch pad waiting to be launched into outer space. And this is mission control. (laughs) Right? Now, I know we're not astronauts, but the truth is, if you're really engaged and passionate about what you're doing, you can't be distracted. And one of the best ways that I know to remain engaged is to always quit when I'm ahead. Walking away from your work when you're frustrated lessens the chance that you're ever going to come back to it and increases your vulnerability for distractions. Instead, solve whatever it is that's troubling you and shut it down. That way you'll be encouraged to get back to it. That's a big one. In the meantime, we said it already tonight, live your life, do something else, anything else, guilt-free. Much of what I know about drawing was learned while taking breaks from playing music, and today I'm a far better musician due to the breaks that I take from animation. The process is all pretty much the same upstairs. It's like this problem-solving activity that connects, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. I just know that when I'm drawing or sculpting or writing or any of this kind of stuff, it all feels the same upstairs. It's sort of this organic brain food. Um, Next, this is a big one. I think we touched on it already. Raise your heart rate for 15 minutes or so per day, and I can almost guarantee that after you finish vomiting and the burning (laughs) sensation, it fades from your muscles, your creative juices actually flow. The heaps and heaps of medication created by science to battle anxiety and depression pales in comparison sometimes (laughs) to common exercise. That's not to say we don't need medication. Again, I'm not a doctor. Some of us do. But exercise is sort of a quick and easy fix. Lastly, a a lesson from my brother, a ball-bearing salesman in a small farming town in northern Canada. That was their, uh, anyway. Best ball-bearing salesman in the world, no joke. He loved his job, and he once asked me how I liked mine, and I told him I didn't. And I'll never forget what he said. He told me, it's not the responsibility of your job to show you a good time, you idiot. (laughs) It's actually the opposite, dummy. And to this day... Uh, when I get to work, I put my hand on the door and I make a conscious decision to either do good work or go home. And honestly, some days I go home and that's okay. But if I go in, I go in hard for the work, for the job, and for me. And those are just a few ways that I stay motivated. Thank you.
Just a moment here. Just a moment. Yeah, it's, uh, the screen's black. Uh, Thanks, Steve. Josh. Steve, revenge from the grave. <laughs> oh, it just went to sleep. Uh, hmm. It's coming too. Okay. I don't know if it's going to work on that. Patience. Uh, that one there. Yeah. I want to close all this. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. There we go. All right. Uh, so my name's Jake. I'm a concept artist, designer, and animator on Cuphead, which is coming out someday. It's going to happen. 2016. All right. Uh, so this talk is aimed at those of you that aren't fully satisfied with your jobs, whether you'd rather be in a different position in the game industry or doing something else entirely. If you're totally happy with what you've got going on, just uh, space out for a bit or take a nap or, you know, just fill the time. So we all get into this industry because we love games and animation, and we want to help make them for a living. But upon entry, many of us become a small part of a large pipeline, often with brutal hours, tight quotas, and not much creative influence, let alone any choice in what you work on each day. This is a fine position to start in, and depending on you and the studio, it might even be a good place to stay. Every person and job is different. And at the end of the day, we're all making games. But ultimately, for me, I want a job where I have heavy creative input and freedom. I'm extremely lucky to have that with Cuphead. This is an amazing industry, and those of us working in it now should be very grateful. Work hard and appreciate your job, but don't settle in and get too comfortable if it's not what you'd like to be doing five years from now. If you're going to spend 40% of your days doing something, it might as well be something you love. So what would you love to do for a living? I'm sure many of you know, and some of you don't. Some of you are afraid to pursue it, and some of you are working your asses off to get it. Some of you are hoping you just somehow end up there, and some of you think what you want isn't even possible. Which is bullshit. You really can do anything, as long as it doesn't break the laws of physics. Anybody that may have told you otherwise is full of shit. How could anyone possibly know your potential? If somebody else can do it, why not you? You can do anything that others can enjoy, enjoy for a living. You just have to do something about it. You can't expect where you are now to magically lead to the place you want to be. Even if all you want is a higher position at your studio, there's no guarantee you'll ever be promoted if you only do the requirements of your job. Unless the head of the company you work for is your grandma. <laughs> Don't put your future in anyone else's hands because nobody else is plotting to get you what you want. The only way to get what you want is to work for it or get very lucky, but you cannot count on that. That's up to you and nobody else. This is a trigger warning. So if you know what you want, and you have the time, you only have two options. One, try to get where you want to be. Or two, die, having never really tried to get there. You only have one life. You either try or you don't, and tomorrow is not guaranteed. Sorry about that. Uh, let's talk about flowers. Um, imagine somebody that makes flower hats. Do you think they could make a living 10 years ago? Maybe, but probably not. Back then, you were limited by your location. Is there a gallery nearby willing to sell them? Are there enough people around that want them? Well, now the world's completely opened up. Over three billion people have the internet, and each one of them is a potential customer or supporter if you can get your work in front of them. I submit that in today's world, if you work hard enough making flower hats, you could make a living. And if you can make a living with flower hats, you can make a living with anything. So don't rule anything out. You have something unique to give to the world. You've all had completely different experiences. You've been influenced by different people and you've worked through different hardships. Because of that, nobody can make what you can. 
You just have to get good at it. And it's never been easier to get your work out there either. If you both consistently post quality work and reach out and connect with others, you will slowly but surely, at the very worst, build up an audience and network of people that want only what you have to offer. There's never been a better time to be an artist. So if you know what you want, if you're not working toward it, why not? Something that many of us struggle with is a lack of motivation. I believe there is internal and external motivation. External motivation comes from things like seeing others work hard and achieve, experiencing others' great works, getting positive feedback on what you're doing, going to talks. External motivation is enough to push you to action, but it won't keep you going. It wavers. Some days you're so motivated and inspired, you'll burst if you don't pour it into something. And some days you've got nothing. You can't rely on it. It's like somebody giving you jumper cables. What you need is internal motivation. It's a battery that will always keep you going, if you keep it full. It's something that will get you out of bed to work on your project instead of sleeping in. Something that will cause you to choose to work because you want to, instead of doing something you know is less important. One way to build it up is to imagine that you've achieved your goal. Imagine yourself being an animation director at a studio, or whatever it is. It's a good feeling. Sometimes we only think about the giant mountain of work and sweat, and not about what's at the top of that mountain. You need to think about why you would actually put in all those hours. Just as important as setting smaller goals that aren't some hazy mirage way in the distance. These give you or something you can get done in a week or two. These give you something very tangible to work toward, and those accomplishments empower you, and they prove to yourself that you, you are making progress. Therefore, you can keep making progress. But it's not easy. We all know that. Improving at something is frustrating, because to improve, you must fail. And failing at something you'd love to be good at isn't fun. Look for satisfaction not in doing something well, but in your own improvement. Never sell yourself short. You deserve to achieve your dreams. Uh, if there's something you want in this life, go get it, because you can. It may take a long time, but all you have to do is show up each day and try. And eventually you'll get there. And when you do, you'll be able to do what you love in a way that nobody else can. Thank you.